from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Um, John, are we on? Okay. Uh, I'm Pross Gifford, the director of the Office of Scholarly Programs and the Kluge Center next door. And we've come to one of those uh, moments which is both uh, joyful and sad. Joyful because uh, we will hear from Mark Knoll, who's been a marvelous scholar in the Kluge Center. I'll say a little bit more about him in a minute. And sad because he's nearing the end of his time with us. Um, so just as we get to know people, they leave. But that is part of the renewal of institutional life as anyone associated with universities is aware. Uh, <clears throat> Mark Knoll is at present the McManus Chair of Christian Thought at Wheaton College in Illinois and the co-founder and advisor for the Institute for the Study of American Evangelists, or even, excuse me, Evangelicals, um, about which he's written a great deal. Uh, the book which I first came across um, and was very taken with is America's God from Jonathan Edwards to Abraham Lincoln. But that's only one of a, of a number of books. Um, another recent one is The Work We Have to Do, A History of Protestants in America. Uh, he wrote one in 94 called The Scandal of the Ev Evangelical Mind. And in uh, an earlier one in 86, Between Faith and Criticism, Evangelicals, Scholarship, and the Bible in America. And in again in 96, Adding Cross to Crown, the Political Significance of Christ's Passion. Uh, he has re received his PhD from Vanderbilt University and has taught at a number of institutions, including the Harvard Divinity School, the Divinity School at the University of Chicago, Westminster Theological Seminary, and Regent College in Vancouver. Uh, I could go on, but I won't, because you're not here to hear me. You're here to hear Mark Knoll, who's going to talk to us about a subject in which he's deeply knowledgeable, that is the Bible in American public life. This time in the later period, the period from 1860 to the present, dilemmas at the center, insights from the margin. Mark. I'm grateful, Prosser, for that uh, kind introduction. Um, the Library of Congress is an awfully impressive place when you drive by it. It's a much more impressive place when you're inside it and able actually to put it to use and especially when you're able to put it to use with as helpful and considerate a staff as the Kluge Center uh, puts, puts before you, it's kind of like uh, we would say in the Midwest, uh, academic hog heaven. <laughs> this country is, as everybody knows, a creation of the Bible, and the Bible is still holding its own, exercising enormous influence as a real spiritual power in spite of all the destructive tendencies. These words, spoken 102 years ago this month, came from an unexpected source. As part of an address delivered by Solomon Schechter at the dedication of the main building of the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York City, they echo echoed what was then a common assertion about the biblical character of the United States. Yet much more frequently, such words came from Christian commentators and with specific reference to the Christian character of the scriptures. Thus, only a few years after Schechter's address, the governor of New Jersey addressed a crowd of about 12,000 in Denver on the subject, the Bible and progress. The occasion was the 300th anniversary of the publication of the King James Version. In his speech, Woodrow Wilson, called scripture the Magna Carta of the human soul, and he summarized the burden of his remarks like this. The Bible, with the, its individual value of the human soul, is undoubtedly the book that has made democracy and been the source of all progress. What Schechter and Wilson wanted to say is that without full consideration of the Bible, no adequate account of American history 
or of American national ideals was possible. A century and more later, much has changed. Political, social, legal, and cultural developments have altered the practice of religion and of everything else in America. Yet despite manifold changes, reading of the Bible, reverence for the Bible, reference to the Bible, and debate over whether and how to use the Bible continue as constant features in American life. Our setting in the Library of Congress offers a particularly apt venue for considering this subject. We are gathered, after all, right next to the room that houses the library of Woodrow Wilson. The library's collections constitute one of the world's great repositories of printed Bibles and other materials related to the scriptures. We are also located only 150 yards south of the Supreme Court, where six weeks ago the court heard oral arguments concerning whether or how the Ten Commandments may be displayed on public property. Most pertinently, we sit today literally just down the road and literally just across the street from the sites where two notable Americans made the most effective use of the Bible ever in our nation's public history. I'm referring, of course, to Martin Luther King, Jr. and the speech he delivered from the East Steps of the Lincoln Memorial on August 28, 1963, during the March on Washington for Civil Rights, and to Abraham Lincoln and his second inaugural address, which he delivered from the east side of the Capitol on March 4, 1865. Beyond Cavill, the extraordinary force of these addresses owed much to their anchorage in Scripture. Yet the two speeches were quite different and so served to illustrate the various ways that the Bible has been put to use in American public life. First, we can see in them a rhetorical or stylistic echoing of Scripture, where speakers, in order to increase the gravity of their own words, employ a phraseology, a cadence, or a tone that parallels the classic fr phrasing of the King James Version. The most dramatic example in our entire history of such a biblical tone may, in fact, be King's speech in August 1963, which was filled with biblically sounding phrases. The Negro finds himself in exile in his own land. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred and many more. Second use of the Bible may be called evocative, where speakers put actual biblical phrases to use, but as fragments and jerked out of context in order to heighten the persuasive power of what they are trying to say for their own purposes. Lincoln used the Bible this way in his second inaugural when he took the phrase from Genesis 3.19 to say, it was strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. Third, in political deployment of scripture, the Bible is quoted or paraphrased to make a direct assertion about how public life should be ordered. The difference from merely rhetorical or evocative use is the speaker's implicit claim that scripture is not just supplying a universe from which to extract morally freighted vocabulary, but that it positively sanctions the speaker's vision for how public life should be ordered. Thus, Martin Luther King, toward the end of his great speech, quoted Isaiah chapter 40, verse 4, in order to enlist a divine sanction for his vision of a society free of racial discrimination. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places shall be made plain, the crooked places shall be made straight, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. In his second inaugural, Lincoln did something similar when he combined resignation before the workings of providence with an indictment of the ones who had asked God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. For that combination of opinions, a quotation from Matthew chapter 18, verse 7, was Lincoln's clincher. The prayers of both sides could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must not needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. 
Political use of scripture is at once more dangerous and more effective than the rhetorical or evocative. It is more dangerous because it risks the sanctified polarization that has so often attended the identification of a particular political position with the specific will of God. It can also be dangerous for religion. In the telling words of Leon Wieseltier, the surest way to steal the meaning and therefore the power from religion is to deliver it to politics, to enslave it to public life. Yet political use of scripture can also be remarkably effective. When a specific political position is successfully identified with the purposes of God, that position can be advanced with tremendous moral energy. And the energy of, uh, of a, uh, the vocal cords can also be enhanced with a little <laughs> drink. When a specific political position can be shown to be biblical, then you have moral energy. And with these two speeches, str strategic quoting from the Bible played a significant part in reassuring many Americans that Lincoln's opposition to slavery and King's opposition to racial discrimination really did embody a divine imperative. Finally, after rhetorical, evocative, and political usages, there is the theological deployment of scripture where the Bible is quoted or paraphrased to make an assertion about God and the meaning of his acts or providential control of the world. In American public life, this use of the Bible is by far the rarest. Lincoln's second inaugural may in fact represent its only instance. What he said pertained not primarily to the fate of the nation and not even to a defense of his own political actions, but to the sovereign character and mysterious purposes of God. For that statement, a quotation from Psalm 19.9 provided the last word. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which in the providence of God must needs come, but which having continued through his appointed time he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible woe, war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away, yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled up by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. As one of those believers in a living God whom Lincoln referred to here, I am convinced that only his public articulation of scripturally derived theological principle about the sovereignty of God can explain the unprecedented humility that followed in the second inaugural peroration. In other words, without a scriptural theology concerning the righteousness of God's ultimate judgment, there would have been no proclamation of malice toward none and charity toward all. The orations by King and Lincoln were unusual because they brought a panoply of biblical testimony to bear on circumstances of great public moment at times of evident national crisis. King's dramatic address underscored a turning point in the nation's moral history when, nearly a century after the end of the war to end slavery, the United States was moving haltingly to confront the bitter realities of racial discrimination. For Lincoln, an unexpectedly calm meditation near the conclusion of an unexpectedly violent war became the occasion for profound reflections on the inexorable costs of justice delayed, the counterintuitive blessing of charity for all, and the unfathomable mysteries of divine providence. In both cases, the Bible was indispensable for shaping what the speaker said. 
But now, long after Lincoln applied his words to bound, bind up the nation's wounds, and more than a generation removed from King's appeal to let freedom ring, we inhabit a cultural and political landscape in which it is considerably more difficult to draw on the resources of scripture as Lincoln and King did. The difficulties concern both, both more narrowly religious and more broadly political factors. The first instance since World War II, the Bible has shrunk to a smaller place in the American cultural landscape. The issue may not be primarily a decline in the distribution of scripture, since Bible sales continue very strong, so much as an incredible expansion in the distribution of other media. Bible content can hold its own in an age of proliferating media, as evidenced by the considerable success of electronic products like the Jesus film, Mel Gibson's The Passion of Christ, or the children's programming provided by VeggieTales. Bible content cannot, however, dominate in an entrepreneurial age of democratic media in the way that the King James Version once provided a conceptual canopy for the entire English-speaking world. Reference to the once dominant place of the King James Version draws attention to the good news, bad news constituted by the proliferation over the last half century of new Bible translations. The good news is that modern translations present the Bible as an open, accessible book in a way that it was ceasing to be when the archaic King James prevail as the Bible of the English-speaking world. The bad news is that no one of the new translations comes anywhere near to the broad linguistic and conceptual currency that the King James Version once enjoyed. When Lincoln in 1858 spoke of a house divided, or in 1865 of judging not that ye be not judged, almost all educated people who heard him recognized not only that he was citing the Bible, but that he was using the very words of Scripture that they themselves had also read, heard, and inwardly digested. The gain in accessibility that the new translations all genuinely offer is matched by a loss in familiarity with the King James Version that once provided the culture as a whole. Difficulties in the public use of the Bible caused by the multiplication of modern media and the proliferation of new translations are, however, puny when compared to difficulties caused by contemporary political realities. Part of this difficulty is structural and, for traditional Christian believers, nicely ironic. The United States may be today the most religiously pluralistic nation that has ever existed on the face of the earth. It has become so, at least in part, because of political values encouraged by the American democratic appropriation of teachings derived from the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. With the religious pluralism resulting from an explicit policy of religious freedom, it risks misunderstanding, if not also offense, for leaders to employ the Bible as if the Bible necessarily spoke to and for the citizenry as a whole. Yet difficulties with the public use of scripture arising from American religious pluralism are not what spring most easily to mind when, at least in Washington, D.C., at least in the wake of the 2004 presidential election, questions are raised about the public use of the Bible. Rather, it is the clamor of partisan political polemics. Naturally, in such a climate, extreme voices attract the most attention. On the one side, we hear rhetorical, evocative, and political use of the Bible on behalf of partisan national or political goals. Thus, in one well-reported kerfuffle from late in 2003, a deputy undersecretary of defense for intelligence was reported as delivering speeches before local churches in which he proclaimed that the real enemy in the battles against Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein was a spiritual enemy called Satan, and that America as a Christian nation needed to come against its enemies in the name of Jesus in order to achieve military success. Such sentiments were intended to do what Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King Jr. had done with similarly biblical rhetoric, but this effort was so clearly advanced to promote a contested moral position and to combat domestic opponents of the war that its striving for biblical authority fell flat. On the other side, we hear partisan panic about how public invocation of scripture heralds the dawning 
of a theocratic dark age. Thus, in a recent issue of the American Prospect, an author introduced a consideration of President Bush and his supporters with a fusillade of fear-mongering. History judges religious zealots harshly, particularly those wielding state power. The Crusades slaughtered millions in the name of Jesus. The Inquisition brought the torture and murder of millions more. After Luther, Christians did bloody battle with other Christians for another three centuries. Apart from a loose grasp of historical fact, assertions like these betray an incredible confidence in the moral power of merely secular norms, which in actual historical situations have never lived up to the claims made for them. The combined result from recent changes in the religious landscape, touching the translation and circulation of the Bible, and recent changes in the political landscape, touching polemical uses and polemical resistance to scripture, is a series of dilemmas. These dilemmas can be expressed as a vicious cycle. The more religiously plural the nation becomes, the less it is natural for the citizenry as a whole to grasp the significance of the Bible. The less it is natural for the citizenry as a whole to grasp the significance of the Bible, the more it is likely that the Bible is used to appeal to only some of its citizens. The more it is likely that the Bible is used to appeal to only some of the citizens, the greater the likelihood of partisan and therefore superficial use of the Bible. The greater the likelihood of partisan and therefore superficial use of the Bible, the more the Bible loses its integrity as a public force. The more the Bible loses its integrity as a public force, the more irrelevant it looks in a religiously plural nation. But the more irrelevant or partisan or superficial the Bible becomes in a religiously pluralistic nation, the less likely that leaders can use scripture for the self-sacrificing, altruistic, or prophetic purposes that within shouting distance of where we are assembled today, Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King Jr. put the Bible so dramatically to use. So what is to be done? At this point, I'm more than happy as a historian to hand this series of dilemmas over to pundits, political theorists, and theologians. But as a historian, and especially a historian given the privilege of spending an academic year at the Library of Congress, more can be said. Especially by shifting attention away from those, these dilemmas that are now so obvious at the center of power. If we move to the margins, that is to voices or groups with strong opinions about the American use of the Bible, but with little standing in American public life, we discover a set of engaging observations and perhaps even intimations of a way forward. And so in the second part of the lecture, I would like to draw attention to four such perspectives from the margins, which I will treat in order from far away to closer at hand. First are the opinions of European Catholics before and during the American Civil War. Second are the opinions of French Quebec nationalists during the last part of the 19th century. Third are the opinions of Jewish immigrants to the United States, especially from the start of the 20th century. And fourth are the opinions of African Americans to the era of the First World War. Foreign Catholic commentators on the Civil War paused often to note the prominence of scripture in debates that led up to the outbreak of conflict and that transformed the conflict into a religious war. What struck foreign Catholics most forcibly was the moral confusion that resulted when a fervent trust in scripture was exercised democratically. For Southern whites and a substantial number of Northern moderates and conservatives as well, it was obvious that the Bible in some manner or other legitimated slavery. Thus, at a fast day sermon in December 1860, a Presbyterian minister, Henry Van Dyke of New York, New York, not South Carolina, examined the many New Testament passages that simply accepted Roman slavery as an incontestable fact of life. Van Dyke's conclusion spoke for a wide swath of American opinion. To him, it was obvious that the tree of abolitionism is evil, and only evil, root and branch, flower and leaf and fruit, that it springs from and is nourished by 
an utter rejection of the scriptures. But of course, for many abolitionists, the Bible spoke just as clearly in opposition to slavery. For them, biblical passages like the Golden Rule as it recorded in the Gospels, therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. Or the egalitarian mandate of Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, for all ye are one in Christ. These scriptures completely ruled out the practice of slavery. From abroad, this division in interpreting the same sacred text drew sharp criticism. The Paris politician, Augustin Cochon, who was one of the leading liberal Catholics of his generation, published in 1861 a substantial tome with the straightforward title, L'Abolition de l'Esclavage, The Abolition of Slavery, which mounted one of the era's most thorough biblical, theological, and historical attacks on the institution. But this book's abolitionism differed from American efforts by including a strong defense of Roman Catholicism, especially with respect to the scriptures. The manner in which men find in the Bible all that their interest desires fills me with astonishment. And I thank God once more for having caused me to be born in the bosom of a church which does not abandon the holy books to the interpretations of caprice and selfishness. Of all foreign Catholic attention to the American Civil War, it was a substantial journal edited by Italian Jesuits, La Civiltà Cattolica, that made the sharpest criticism. To the Italian Jesuits, all of American history was tied in knots because of problems related to biblical interpretation. American religion began with the Puritans who tried to found a new social and political life on the basis of their own religious doctrine. The result was an extensive despotism over every detail of life. But then in reaction to Puritan despotism, the United States lurched to the other extreme by setting up an absolute separation of church and state. This separation did offer unprecedented liberty, but so great was that liberty that it undercut the Protestants' professed desire to order all of life by the Bible. The sacred text, in the words of the Italians, is explained by each one according to his own will and under the influence of a rationalistic philosophy. These circumstances explain why Americans were constantly founding new churches on the claim of new effusions of the Holy Spirit. Civiltà Cattolica's interpretation of the Civil War tied the breakup of the United States as a political entity to its history as an experiment in Protestant public order. The Jesuits expressed mingled admiration and humor in finding that, as they put it, suddenly, both parties have become theologians. The one side quoting the Pentateuch to justify slavery, the other side quoting the gospel to condemn it. While the Jesuits did find much to praise in American religion, they nonetheless saw a great mistake, a missing principle that is dissolving a great union. That missing element was religious unity. Reconciliation would elude the Americans because they are divided on a moral question and moral questions are fundamentally grounded in religious dogma. But if Americans understood the true character of religious authority, then it would be possible to use scripture with greater effect. If the Americans lived where their rights and their trust in scripture were, quoting the Jesuits, assured by an authority respected by both parties, then the Bible could come into the conflict not as a plaything, but as in a contest of truth over against falsehood. Such an authority, which obviously meant the Roman magisterium, could exercise an almost invincible strength over the two parties so that one would surrender or that both would be reconciled to each other. As it was, however, their lack of independence makes it impossible to find a solution to their quarrel, both because they lack a central religious authority and because they lack moral honesty, which is itself a consequence of not having a central religious authority. A conservative Roman Catholic solution to American problems, even I might say this week, in the use of scripture hardly seems a solution that could be promoted today. To make it work, a massive campaign would be required to convince Americans both that the Bible should be regarded as an authoritative norm for public life 
and that the interpretation of the Bible should be given over to one particular Christian authority. Nonetheless, to contemplate a situation in which, as the Italian Jesuits put it, the Bible could be used not as a plaything, but as a contest of truth over against falsehood deserves, at least for citizens who believe in the beauty of truth and the peril of falsehood, a moment of calm reflection. A very different kind of commentary in the American use of the Bible arose in the second half of the 19th century when Quebec Catholics developed an extensive scriptural interpretation of their own country. Here the commentary in the United States was indirect, but no less thought-provoking. These Catholic Quebecois knew very well that many in the United States looked upon their nation, as in Solomon Schlechter's words, a creation of the Bible, but they were not at all impressed with this American conceit. Rather, to them, it was French Canada that deserved to be considered the sinusure of providence and the antitype of biblical narrative. The view that, as a modern scholar puts it, French America was nothing less than the new Israel of God was promoted for the better part of 50 years by a number of prominent clerics and provincial authorities. Their number included Monsignor Louis Adolphe Paquet, who in 1902 delivered a memorable address to the Societe Jean Baptiste, in which he applied Isaiah chapter 43, verse 21 to the French Canadians. This people have I found for myself. They shall show forth my praise. Especially prominent in promoting the providential history of Quebec was the third bishop of Trois Rivières, Louis Francois La Flèche who in 1865 and 66 published a series of 34 articles in his diocesan paper that were then collected as a book entitled Some Considerations on the Connections Between Civil Society and Religion and the Family. La Flesh is particularly relevant for American examination because of how thoroughly he employed the Bible in setting out his conviction that, as he put it, our mission is the extension of the kingdom of God by the formation of a Catholic people in the Valley of the St. Lawrence. In making such assertions, La Flesh ranged far and wide in Holy Scripture. By his public use of the Bible, La Flesh hoped to provide not only an inspiring vision for Quebec nationalism, but also a practical antidote against what he considered the gravest th threat to Quebec society. That threat he called the fever of immigration to the United States which he described as an epidemic, no less terrible in a sense than the typhus attack of 1848. The theology driving the flesh was an interpretation of scripture that saw nationhood as a direct product of divine action. In his view, God's call of Abraham, as described in Genesis chapters 12 and 13, provided a norm for all of human history. Each nation has received from providence a mission to fulfill, and a determined goal to reach. Biblical history, as well as secular history, showed in addition that God blessed or judged nations depending on how they fulfilled the mission given by God. In the flesh's understanding, the exemplary record established by the founders and early martyrs of French Canada, Jacques Cartier, Samuel du Champlain, the pioneering Jesuit missionary Jean de Brebeuf, and Canada's first bishop, Francois Morancé, de Laval had verified the sacredness of Quebec's destiny. On the basis of this scriptural theology, La Flesch then urged his readers to do their duty by not immigrating to the United States, as well as by supporting God-given authorities in family, government, and church. In presenting these opinions, La Flesch was also a master in using the Bible evocatively and insulting what he wrote with a persistent biblical rhetoric shaped by both the Latin Vulgate and the authorized French Catholic translation of the Bible. For Americans, there should be great benefit in observing La Flesch and his French Catholic compatriots as they read the history of Quebec out of the sacred text. Serious internalizing of biblical narratives and themes has always been a multinational phenomenon. The conclusion that the Bible speaks directly to an individual's nations has flourished at different times in Poland, Ireland, South Africa, Russia, and several other nations, as well as Quebec and the United States, at the least. 
realizing that such usage has taken place might key Americans to the fact that what they have seen in the Bible about themselves, other nations, with less power and apparent influence, have just as easily found out about themselves. At the most, putting the United States' own history of Bible usage in the context of other nations having done the same thing might raise questions about the consequences of entertaining such interpretations. In the case of Catholic and French Quebec, the belief in a scripturally defined destiny would seem to have done less for good and far less for evil than when the same convictions have been entertained in the United States. To move from Quebec Catholic opinion to the opinions of American Jews is to remain at the, a margin defined by ethnicity and religion but to relocate the margin geographically closer to the American center. Jewish organizations do certainly continue to be understandably nervous about efforts to define the United States as a Christian nation. Jewish voters shy away in droves from appeals by the Republican Party featuring biblical values, and influential Jewish spokespersons regularly protest against any trespassing of the divide between church and state. At the same time, it is noteworthy that from the founding of the nation, a prominent strand of Jewish opinion has embraced the proposition that the United States can be identified as an unusually biblical nation. Thus, David Galertner recently wrote in commentary to praise what he calls Americanism and to claim that the Bible is not merely the fertile soil that brought Americanism forth, it is the energy source that makes it live and thrive. More often, Ambiguity has prevailed in Jewish assessments of the Bible and American life. Thus, in the 1850s, Rabbi Isaac Meyer Wise of Cincinnati spoke out against the practice of required readings from the King James Bible in the public school, but Wise also, in 1854, published a book, History of the Israelitish Nation, in which he suggested that American principles of democratic republicanism had been adumbrated in the Hebrew scriptures. The tension between Jewish identity and American identity also defined the context in which Solomon Schechter expressed the opinions with which I began this lecture. Commentary from Schechter is especially interesting since his wide range of experience before coming in 1902 to the United States and the Jewish Theological Seminary included birth and early years in Romania, education in Poland, Austria, and Germany, teaching assignments at Cambridge and the University of London, and much esteemed work on ancient biblical texts in Egypt. The great impression made on Schechter by reading Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address as a youth in Foscani, Romania, perhaps in a Yiddish translation, may have influenced his later views. For Schechter reported that when he contemplated the sentences of this address that I quoted earlier, he could scarcely believe that they formed a part of a message addressed in the 19th century to an assembly composed largely of men of affairs. Instead, Schechter imagined himself transported into a camp of contrite sinners, determined to leave the world and its vanities behind, possessed of no other thought but that of reconciliation with their God. A fuller account of what Schechter had to say in defending the biblical character of the United States is particularly pertinent since his words from 1903 were spoken when Schechter himself was actively supporting Jewish efforts to end Christian Bible reading in New York public schools, when he was working to establish an independent network of private Jewish day schools, and when he was offering full support to the Jewish Publication Society's efforts at producing its own translation of the Hebrew Bible. Given these activities, Schechter's willingness to assert that this country is, as everybody knows, a creation of the Bible deserves close attention. He first suggested that it was particularly the Old Testament that gave the United States its biblical character. Then he expanded upon problems he saw when Americans took such a conviction seriously, including an excess of zeal, a spate of caricature revelations, and the presence of what he called quacks, who create new tabernacles here with new Zions and new Jerusalems. Schechter was using a Jewish vocabulary but students of America's Christian churches could describe all of these excesses and a whole lot more in any fair-minded account of how American Christians have expressed their zealous attachment to Scripture. 
Yet though Schechter was willing to acknowledge problems in the bibliocentric character of the United States, even more did he want to defend that character. He was thus pleased that trust in the Bible was standing up well against what he called all the destructive tendencies mostly of foreign make. And he was convinced that despite genuine difficulties, the large bulk of the American people have in matters of religion retained their sobriety and loyal adherence to the scriptures as their Puritan forefathers did. Schechter's final point in praising the biblical character of the United States came back, however, to the Bible rather than to America. For his audience in New York City in 1903, he wanted to stress that they were celebrating the foundation of a Jewish theological seminary. As he explained what such a foundation meant, Schechter spelled out in great detail how it would be appropriate for ancient Jewish teaching to adapt to the American context by, for example, respecting American democratic traditions. Yet in the end, Judaism was more important than America. He wrote, any attempt, he said, any attempt to confine its activities to the borders of a single country, even be it as large as America, will only make its teachings provincial, narrow, and unprofitable. Rather, the point of a Jewish theological seminary must be to teach the doctrines and the literature of the religion, which is as old as history itself and as wide as the world. An American setting for studying Judaism was important precisely because of how much Bible had gone into the shaping of the United States. But because the study of Judaism took in all of history and implicated the whole world, it, rather than the United States, had to remain the highest concern. To those today who downplay the importance of scriptural grounding for the American experiment, Schechter would appeal for a more positive assessment of what biblical convictions have contributed to American history and American ideals. To those who focus only on excesses of Christian imperialism in American history, he would claim, as a Jew, that this Christian heritage has provided an unusually commodious home for Judaism to thrive. But to those who equate the Bible in America, he would assert that because scripture embraces all of history and all of the world, it must be able to assess, evaluate, and even judge the United States rather than the reverse. When now we turn to African-American understandings of the Bible and public life, we come much closer to the center. Yet because of the particular circumstances of African-American existence, we are also approaching the most persistently marginalized of major American populations. The great national confusion that bore down upon African-Americans with special weight was once well described by David Bryan Davis. In the United States, he wrote, the problem of slavery had become fatally intertwined with the problem of race. Quite apart from its devastating impact on economics and politics, the confusion spotlighted by Davis between race and slavery profoundly affected Christian interpretations of scripture during the first decades of nationhood. From the early 1830s onwards, a great flood of authors labored intensely to interpret the many scriptural passages that seemed simply to take slavery for granted as a natural part of society. By contrast, far less attention to, was devoted to what the Bible affirmed also in many passages about the equality of all races and peoples before God. For African-American Bible believers, the result was doubly unfortunate. On the one hand, they could see more clearly than any of their peers that studying what the Bible had to say about slavery could never illuminate the American dilemma unless the Bible was also studied for what it had to say about race. On the other hand, because of the racist character of American public life, including prejudices about which writings had to be noticed and which could be safely ignored, the considerable writing that African Americans produced in the Bible and slavery received almost no general attention. Despite this disadvantage, black Americans in the antebellum decades regularly offered their own forceful arguments arising from a universal application of scriptural teaching. As an example, the appeal to the colored citizens of the world by David Walker, a free black from Boston, which was published in 1829, 
used the Bible extensively in crafting a powerful manifesto. And one of the many contrasts Walker drew between the universal teachings of Scripture and its particular use by Americans, Walker referred to the Great Commission from Matthew chapter 28, where the resurrected Christ sent out his followers to teach all nations to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Walker berated his white readers with a challenge. You have the Bible in your hands with this very injunction. Have you been to Africa teaching the inhabitants thereof the words of the Lord Jesus? No, far from it. Americans entered among us in Africa and learnt us the art of throat cutting by selling us to fight one against another, to take each other as prisoners of war, and to sell to you for small bits of calicoes, old swords, knives, etc., to make slaves for you and your children. To Walker, such behavior was a direct contradiction of Scripture. Can the American preachers, he said, appeal unto God, the maker and searcher of hearts, and tell him, tell him, with the Bible in their hands, that they made no distinction on account of men's color? A particularly intriguing example of African-American biblical interpretation that followed in the train of David Walker by appealing to the universal norms of Scripture came early in the motion picture era, more than a half a century after the constitutional prohibition of slavery. The huge success of D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, which was released in 1915 as a cinematic version of the Reverend Thomas Dixon's novel, The Klansman, posed a particularly compelling challenge to African Americans and a small number of whites who agreed with them that this film represented an egregious example of the worst kind of public racism. Several times in The Birth of a Nation, biblical words or images were used to make a point about the degeneracy of African Americans and the triumph of the noble Ku Klux Klan over the despicable regimes of Reconstruction. Most dramatic was the movie's closing scenes that mixed visions of civilized whites triumphing over bestial blacks with apocalyptic images of Jesus coming to establish a millennial reign of joyful peace. In response to these provocations, leaders of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People promoted plans with other interested parties to produce their own film to counter what had appeared in the birth of a nation. Out of this effort came eventually a movie directed by John W. Noble entitled The Birth of a Race, which was released in 1919. While neither an artistic nor a commercial success, the film did offer a very different understanding of the Bible and its teachings. Like The Birth of a Nation, The Birth of a Race eventually made a series of grand statements about American patriotism. But most of the film, 70 of its 90 minutes, was devoted to four biblical episodes. The creation of Adam and Eve, Noah and the Flood, Moses and the Exodus from Egypt, and the life and passion of Jesus. Throughout, the Bible was referenced as the charter of equality for all humanity. Thus, Noah's family, which for many Americans had provided the source for a racist exploitation of the curse of Canaan, was described in this film as living together harmoniously. Moses was given the movie's greatest block of time as the one who called for the liberation of his people and his headshots of listeners from Africa, the Far East, and Europe flashed on the screen, Jesus was portrayed as teaching all races. Christ made no distinction between them. His teachings were for all. Christ's passion, moreover, was portrayed as Roman retribution against Jesus' effort to teach equality instead of slavery. Even in the film's last 20 minutes, with its rapid jumble of Christopher Columbus, Paul Revere, signers of the Declaration of Independence, Abraham Lincoln, and racially integrated troops marching off to World War I, a universal message predominated. With dubious theology, but a clear intent to maintain the film's major themes, it described Lincoln's assassination as kindling the torch of freedom, which today is the light of the world. In a word, where the birth of a nation used race as a device for identifying heroes and villains, the birth of a race used the word in its more general sense of encompassing all people. This African-American usage of the Bible echoed much of the standard patriotic usage of white Americans. Where it differed was the, in the contention that the race signaled, signaled out for, singled out for special divine consideration in scripture was the human race.
I hope it's clear from this brief attention to four sets of marginal opinions that the question of the Bible in American public life looks very different depending on the angle from which the question is viewed. The foreign Roman Catholics during the Civil War, the Quebec nationalists of the 19th century, to American Jews in the first generations of immigration, and to African Americans in the period before the exercise of full civil rights, the Bible was held to be a living book and it was held to be relevant to the United States. But it was not relevant in the way that those at the center of American influence, be they Bible believers or Bible deniers, felt it was relevant. Another lecture, probably a pretty long book, would be required to move from description to prescription concerning how the Bible should now be put to use, but let me attempt in conclusion a cautious excursion into the realm of the normative. For this purpose, I would like to use a statement from the Translation Committee of the New Revised Standard Version, chaired by the Venerable Bruce M. Metzger of Princeton Theological Seminary. Its perspective sets out an essential beginning point. In traditional Judaism and Christianity, the Bible has been more than a historical document to be preserved or a classic of literature to be cherished and admired. It is recognized as the unique record of God's dealing with people over the ages. The Old Testament sets forth the call of a special people to enter into covenant relation with the God of justice and steadfast love and to bring God's law to the nations. The New Testament records the life and work of Jesus Christ, the one in whom the word became flesh, as well as describes the rise and spread of the early Christian church. The Bible carries its full message, not to those who regard it simply as a noble literary heritage of the past, or who wish to use it to enhance political purposes and advance otherwise desirable goals, but to all persons and communities who read it so that they may discern and understand what God is saying to them. In the angle provided by this statement, let me propose three premises arising from my own convictions and then three political implications. Premise one, in the terms of the NRSV statement, the Bible is true for all people in all times and all places. Premise two, therefore, the Bible can never be the possession of only one modern nation or of only one faction within a particular nation. Premise three, while everything in the Bible can be construed as political, politics can never exhaust, equal, or contain the message of the Bible. Implication one, American society would be immeasurably poorer if it was no longer possible to bring the universal message of scripture to bear on the particulars of American public life as Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King Jr. did with such memorable effect. Implication two, narrow use of the Bible for partisan political advantage violates what the Bible itself says about the dignity of all human beings under God and also what it says about political power as only a stewardship bestowed by God for the maintenance of order, the guarantee of justice, and the care of the powerless. Implication three, given the current American situation, the only hope for using the Bible in public life that conforms to the Bible's own message is to employ it humbly, wisely, and on behalf of all people. The Library of Congress, sitting in the shadow of the Supreme Court, directly over against the steps of the Capitol and very close to the Lincoln Memorial, can hardly avoid being caught up in questions about how best to put the Bible to use in American public life. My hope, in fact my prayer, is that the library's non-parallel re resources may continue to be sustained, noticed, and employed so that from these resources, others may continue to address fundamental questions essential for the future well-being of the United States and indeed for the future well-being of humankind. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.